All right, welcome to the uh, second session uh, for this first day of the Creative Cities Reframing Downtown uh, Conference. Uh, my name is Mohammed Al Shahid. I will be uh, moderating this panel. Uh, before we begin uh, with our speakers, uh, there's a four to five minute video that's uh, made by uh, Montiti, which is a hyper-local newspaper that's focused on downtown. Uh, the videos are meant to sort of add uh, additional voices that were not able to be present or are not able to be with us on the panels that shed some light on the topics that we'll, we will be discussing. So um, let's watch the video and then I will properly introduce the panel. Um, Iman and did you think? البلد هي فعليا المكان المنطقة اللي في مصر اللي فيها أكبر عدد من أماكن العروض الصخف أماكن العروض سواء سينما أو مسارح مفيش في القاهرة منطقة فيها كم الهائل من من المساحات العرض زي وسط البلد طبعا شارع مدي الدين هو شارع تقليدي للإنتتين من سواء كانت سينما أو مسرح أو ملاهي ليلية كان شارع مدي الدين هو المكان الرئيسي في القاهرة المنطقة منطقة كانت كده وما زالت محتفظة بجزء كبير وإحنا وجودنا ده كان بالصدفة بس فده بيخلي إنه إمكانية إن أنت تعمل مهرجان أنت هنا بتيجي وسط البلد ممكن تتفرج على معرض تشكيلي وبعدين تروح تتعشى وبعدين تروح تتفرج على مسرحية أو تروح مسرحية وبعدين تروح حفلة مزيكا وكل ده أنت في نفس المنطقة ما اتحركتش وجود تاون هاوس في منطقة هي منطقة معروف اسمها كده وهي منطقة محيطة بورش العربيات والسمكرة والحاجات دي كلها ده كان ليه دور مهم جدا ان بيأكد ان الفن مش لخاطر ناس معينة ان الفن لازم يبقى لكل الفئات فده كان حاجة مؤثرة جدا ومهمة جدا ان يبقى في معرض بيحصل وفي ناس ميكانيكية او صنايعية بيطلعوا يتفرجوا على المعرض ويبدأ يفتح لهم أفق هو ايه اللي بيحصل ده But being downtown was essential for us as uh, an active arts institution that's local uh, because not only do we attract a more uh, diverse uh, audience, we're much more easily accessible to people, easy to locate. So being, being part of a downtown environment Uh, allows us to be engaged with local vendors, so we are contributing to the local economy. We consider ourselves a stakeholder, that we are part of the neighborhood. All right, just to, um, just to clarify, the videos are uh, a separate entity. They are created by Montiti again. Um, on the occasion of the conference, but they speak, the speakers and the video speak for themselves. Um, okay, so now we can really do the work. Um, once again, my name is Mohammed Al Shahid uh, from CairoObserver.com, and I will be moderating this panel on uh, artists as urban catalysts uh, in downtown. Um, I should um, put this in context a bit. In uh, December of 2012, uh, cluster organized a, a panel by the same title that was hosted at the Goethe Institute, uh, just a few streets uh, down. Um, and the, at the time, in December 2012, it was just um, really uh, a year after 2011, and a lot has been happening already in terms of art and culture in downtown on the, sort of as, the, as part of the aftermath of um, the revolution. Um, so just to sort of bring things into context, um, by the way, the panel um, in 2012 was uh, with Karim Shafi, who is with us today, um, Bruce Ferguson on behalf of AUC, um, 
Anya Shremsky, who spoke on behalf of Townhouse Gallery. Today we have the gallery's founder, William Wells, and Tamir Al Said, um, who is one of the founding members of Sima Tech, an alternative um, film space uh, in downtown, as well as Heba Farid, who we just saw in the video, who uh, was speaking on behalf of uh, Contemporary Image Collective uh, Photography um, Exhibition uh, and Lab in downtown. Uh, the main question of the panel then was, a uh, quote from the initial um, statement, to re-examine the classical appropriation of artists for urban uh, regeneration. Um, we asked how might things play out, uh, play out differently um, in downtown Cairo um, in relation to what has been happening uh, in processes of gentrification that appropriated artists uh, in other cities, um, and we've discussed some of those uh, in the first panel. Um, in the last three years since this uh, 2012 panel, a lot has happened. Um, what was then uh, an unused, mostly unused uh, AUC campus in downtown, with the exception of this part we're in, has now been uh, reappropriated as the Greek campus just across the street, uh, where startups um, uh, and young companies are uh, establishing their offices. Uh, DCAF, the Downtown Contemporary Arts Festival, uh, has been uh, taken off every year since then. Um, some spaces have opened since 2012 when we met and others have closed. Um, Ashura Mahmoud Basuni was, for example, a very popular space that opened immediately after 2011. It lasted for a very short time, mostly because of financial constraints. Uh, in the meantime, other spaces such as Simatek uh, were able to refurbish their space and they have uh, now a proper screening room, uh, thanks to also the design work of Cluster. So a lot has been happening uh, that merits us to have a sort of a sequel um, to this initial conversation from 2012. Um, so with this, um, you have all, all of you have the program, so I'll, in order to save time, I won't read the biographies of the speakers. So um, please go ahead and, and uh, read them yourselves in there, but uh, I will briefly say that uh, please help me introduce uh, or welcome the first speaker, Jane Hall, uh, from Assemble UK. Hello, uh, my name is Jane. Um, I just want to say thank you uh, for inviting Assemble all the way to Cairo, it's very exciting to be here. Um, so I'm going to just kind of present um, our approach as a collective of architects and designers. Um, we are a group of 18 people um, who came together about five years ago um, to begin working together to try and realize projects, um, which maybe kind of were a way of investigating um, our approach to construction, to building, um, and to the sort of uh, reappropriation of the city. Um, I'm going to just do a kind of brief introduction to sort of frame how I think we see um, our position in London um, and the kind of approach to the production of cultural space and the arts. Um, so culture and creativity have long been recognized as crucial to the ongoing vibrancy of cities and their ability to attract investment from all over the globe. Indeed, London's reputation is characterized by the diversity and innovation of its cultural offer, with the Mayor of London this year again emphasizing the central role of the arts in the delivery of urban regeneration. This, however, has manifest in the production of blockbuster exhibitions, music venues, and global sporting events, um, which have been used as a tool to physically shape and change the city. Um, and so the Olympics in 2012 was a really interesting project for us because our studio, which is one of the projects I will kind of talk to you today about, um, is on the fringes. Um, and we've benefited, benefited greatly from um, the kind of uh, the, the desire to try and invest in cultural projects around the Olympic site as it's completely changed the fabric of the city um, in that area. Um, but we kind of feel as a group that often um, the, the, the artists, the makers, the people who contribute to the sort of cultural idea of what's happening in the city, um, their position and what they need to, to work is often kind of overlooked and they're being moved on um, as kind of 
different various types of gentrification um, kind of start to happen. Um, and it's kind of interesting because at one point, um, the development of cultural activity was seen by the new Labour government in the late 90s um, as a kind of new form of economic policy where the arts could be a driver of a new, a whole new sector and artists and their creative pursuits would be kind of valued for their fiscal relevance. Um, and this has kind of changed slightly more recently because a lot of the things that we get asked to do is a kind of extension of this thinking where we um, kind of asked as artists to offer a service that will tackle social objectives. Um, which, you know, you can argue, especially with the kind of history of the UK and the welfare state, is something that this, the government should be um, kind of much more involved in um, supporting in a kind of long-term way. So um, that's kind of where we are. And um, so I'm going to show you our first few projects so you kind of get an understanding of the types of things that we build. Um, point it out. <laughs> um, oh, I can do it from here, yeah. Um, so this is our first project, it's called the Cinerolium, um, where we uh, negotiated with a developer to get a sort of short-term um, use of his site in central London, in Clark and Well Road. Um, so he owned a petrol station, and we turned it into a cinema for five weeks. Um, and as a group, we... Um, kind of built it ourselves, we looked for funding ourselves, we contacted um, various manufacturers and the whole premise was this um, cinema space would be recreated uh, to sort of draw on the ideas of cinema going as a social activity, yet we were using Tyvek, so you know, the kind of damp proof membrane of, of building fabric and um, scaffolding boards and trying to create something and elevate uh, the materials to create a kind of really special space and you know what would happen is you'd cut you'd come into the cinema you'd watch your film and then at the end we would all be standing around the curtain and we'd lift it so you would be kind of thrown back out onto the street which is the kind of last photo sort of shows that image of what would happen to you at the end of a film um, and this was really successful the site in the end has not been developed the petrol station is still there um, and it's kind of had a this kind of longevity in terms of sort of memory and the imprint that it's left on, on this space. Um, and we kind of recreated these ideas the following year under a flyover in Hackney Wick, which is actually the place where the most number of artists in Europe have their studios. It's, um, but they're all occupying kind of old warehouses, ex-industrial um, use, um, which might not be conducive to the work they actually want to produce, and they are suffering from huge amounts of development as they too are on the Olympic fringe. Um, so we uh, got borrowed the site from the local council um, and got funding from Create, um, who are kind of arts charity who invest in social product projects, um, and we sort of transformed it again into a cinema, but also a cafe and we hosted workshops for the local community and it kind of became a kind of local center where people could meet, they could do yoga, they could hold events um, and um, this was throughout the summer. We again built this all by hand. Um, they're wooden bricks that have all been drilled in two places. There are 11,000 of them. Um, so you can see the space before. Um, and so now part of the paving that we put down there, that's been installed permanently and has um, permanent power on the site. So the site can now be used um, kind of for more uh, long-term permanent uses. Um, so our projects... Um, so there's kind of three things that I kind of want to touch on. Um, the first one is uh, our, our kind of way of negotiating funding um, for a lot of our projects. And the biggest one we have at the moment is um, the development of our own studio space, um, which is in uh, Bromley by Bow. Um, and we're in an old sign painting factory. Um, so it's uh, along a canal, uh, lots of other kind of fabricators and makers are there. There's a music school. It's kind of a real mix, but you have no sense of this community when you're you're walking around. Um, and this is the space that we got from Newham Council um, to occupy for five years. 
uh, Peppercorn Rent. And it's actually owned by a land um, a landowner called Landprop. Um, and they own the entire site and have a plan to develop over a 10-year period. Yet the council don't want to let them demolish all of the buildings in one go, which is what they would wish to do, because they're worried that something may happen over a decade and the site wouldn't get developed and they just have this sort of wasteland. So um, we've been kind of installed to occupy the site and try and open it up for sort of a, a more public-facing um, activity. Um, make use of the space uh, to hold events and um, we had our cinema in there one, once before too but now we've really moved towards trying to make it a sustainable place for makers um, and architects and um, carpenters um, so the whole site has become a, a big workshop um, and uh, the workshop itself is run by workshop east who are local carpenters um, and uh, we have access to this workshop which, which they've developed for us on the site. Um, this is our kind of main space uh, which um, we do a lot of kind of large scale self building and this really been able, enabled us to change our approach to design um, because unlike a normal studio um, kind of office, uh, a traditional architect's office, we have a warehouse space where we can build one to one tests and we are in close proximity to those makers who can share their skills with us. Um, so it's a kind of unusual and very fruitful relationship um, for us. And so this has been extended into a project called Yard House, which um, is next door to our studios, which was funded by the LLDC, who are the London Legacy Development Corporation, who um, are in charge of developing all cultural activity and any planning or building in and around the Olympic Park. Um, and so they funded this project in part, and we match funded it um, to produce um, new, art, uh, new artist studios. So it's a new build, and the model was to try and create something that was economically viable as a new build. Um, it cost about half as much to produce as the next cheapest new build in the area for artist studios. Um, and the idea is the whole thing is this kind of timber framed structure that is then covered in king span which is an insulated structural panel um, and we can take the whole thing down and bring it with us when we get chucked off the site in a couple of years time which also makes it um, a kind of great way to uh, it has this kind of temporary property as well as also providing a permanent home for up to 16 different artists um, we built this one ourselves over a one-month period, each concrete tile is was kind of handmade um, and used to clad the building. Um, and these are kind of, kind of some of the spaces um, that have been inhabited since. And so we have a range of makers, um, and the kind of design of the the, the building was to um, kind of centralise, uh, have an atrium space at the centre so that um, we could really try and create community. As you go up the stairs, you can see into other people's studios. You, you see a connection between, between people and what's happening. And um, because everyone in these studios knows each other very well now, we have a lot of events in our yard space. We have open studios. We have markets. Um, and we have parties, which is the best bit. Um, so Black Horse Workshop is a project where we try to take our interest in making um, kind of carpentry and amateur craft really a part of the community in the way that you would expect to have a library, a swimming pool, school, all these amenities. Why not the workshop as a kind of important bit of um, community life? Um, and this was done in partnership with uh, Walthamstow uh, Council. Um, and again, Create, um, who have previously funded our projects. Um, and we became the kind of, uh, we did the business plan. Um, we really drove this project forward um, in terms of, man in management terms, as well as designing the space. Um, and there's a cafe there, um, and it's open as a kind of membership thing. So you become a member and you have access to the space. Um, there are technicians employed full time who will help you to kind of create and make um, your project um, and this has to be uh, this is continued continually funded through the council and through arts council and this is one of our main problems is 
it seems to be we're able to kind of create these spaces and get them off the ground, but long-term funding um, is, is a big issue. Um, so here are some people making some things. Um, and my last project is the Baltic Street Adventure Playground, which kind of moves off the topic slightly in that it's not a maker space, but it's a place where we uh, created a playground in Glasgow in Scotland, which is one of the poorer areas of the UK. Um, and this is the playground. It's basically an empty site with a lot of mud. And um, our role here was to really not be the people who designed the playground, but who tried to get this disused piece of land back into use and get a community interested in sustaining it and in creating it and owning it. Um, so we did a series of workshops kind of based on how people used to play when we didn't have these problems with risk where kids were allowed to build. Um, and so a lot of the time was spent in just uh, bringing people to the site and making them feel involved in the production of the space, whatever that might become, and employing a full-time play worker. And so this was very minimal. This was just about a few hammers, some scraps of timber, and uh, uh, a kind of a container on site with things like fire and cooking and the central part of the education program, which would make people um, encourage children to, to come and learn. Um, and so then things became more formalized and uh, we worked on the, the design um, and have ended up with a playground uh, a bit more like this, but where the activities um, that really kind of drove uh, the, the, the kind of uh, community to come out and use the space um, still happen. Um, and this is an, an ongoing project um, where we've tried to be the people who kind of instigate the understanding of what a space could be rather than just designing it. Uh, for people to use. Um, so yeah, that's that's Assemble. Um, thank you for, for listening. Um, uh, thank you very much, Jane. Very inspiring. Uh, it's a kind of architectural practice we uh, aspire for in Cairo. Um, hopefully we'll speak more about this after.